good here. Testing, testing. All right. So uh, my name is Dale Pike. I am the executive director and associate provost for a group we call Technology Enhanced Learning and Online Strategies at Virginia Tech. I'm on the board with Newton. And we were asked to lead a session that may become multiple sessions. It, uh, this is a pretty open um, period of time where we really want to focus on all of these C's, the creative collaboration, consortia, collaboratives, crazy workloads. The reality of this kind of a, an event is that you have all these ideas, all these great things that come to mind. And having an organization like COAT is a very helpful framework so that it doesn't all just kind of turn into that stack of notes that you stuff underneath the other notes that go on top of it and feel guilty about six months from now when you're throwing everything away. Uh, COAT can help you to stay connected with each other. One of the things that we're interested in exploring is within that collaborative, within any, within any kind of uh, collaborative structure, but especially sort of this superstructure. You're a member of many groups. You're a member of a community on your campus. You're a member of a professional discipline. And there are particular online groups that, you're, that you may be associated with. Um, how do you keep up? How do you, how do you stay engaged? How do you prioritize that activity? And sort of conversely, coming back to those who are in charge of keeping these organizations running, how can an organization provide you with the right kinds of opportunities that are right there just in time when you have an idea and you want to reach out and find some collaborators? It, this is a very tough gig. You know, the, the, those who are very interested will show up no matter what you do. You need the middle of the bell curve to come along if you're going to really uh, make a dent in some of these issues that we're, that we're facing. And I think what, that's one of the roles that universities and systems and collaboratives and consortia can play. But I also think that, that it's, it's a hard thing. So really just interested in opening up the discussion. And I think that, um, after maybe a couple of comments, what, what, what we thought was there may be a couple of topics and ideas that come together. It would be great if we could leave with some action items. What are some things that we'd, we'd be interested in making as a proposal to Coate or proposal to Newton? We don't want to, and, and remember, we don't want this just to be stuffed in the stack of papers just so it's not an overcommitment. You get really excited and think that you can have all the time in the world. What are some realistic things we could do to facilitate keeping this conversation going in your daily lives? Thoughts, ideas? Let's go back here. Uh, oftentimes, we all give very similar workshops at our institutions. And uh, I know, like probably many of you, you look at online to see what other people have done before you do it. And if I see something that's really nice on your website that you've posted your slides and your presentation materials, uh, I usually contact people so I can just use it. If you would just CC license that so I wouldn't have to contact you, that would be awesome. Because then if you gave this really great presentation on rubrics and now I have to give a presentation on rubrics and yours is already really great, I don't want to have to make it over again. So if you just CC license it, I can just use it. That's a great idea. And I think that's representative of the kind of thing that really takes very little effort um, to, to consider that Creative Commons kind of licensing. I think you could, if you think of the role of an organization, one of the things we might do is actually put a little bit of structure. We're, we're already asking you for your materials to put in, in place. What if you considered how those might be reused, even in just how they're posted? Um, you could even leave room for a conversation and discussion about ways people are using the content. It doesn't take a huge amount of effort to start creating those contact points. Um, you had a, a so, comment? Um in 2012, in 2012 um, 
Newton came uh, to do uh, similar to this year. I think it was 2012. Um, and we set up a group in our online commons for collaboration and continued conversation between Newton and um, SUNY. And so I just want to put that out there um, again, that we have this group where um, we could all join and continue um, to share a network and um, uh, you know, collaborate with each other online after the end of this conference. I, I tweeted out the link to the group, okay. by the way. Uh, I've come over here. Let's yeah. see if this is, yes. So, I don't know if you're pointing to me or not. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so just to build on what Alex was saying, um, when we created that group, um, the focus was um, we had a session here at this conference where we said what challenges are we facing as, um, you know, a community? And what are some ways that people are addressing those challenges? And, you know, for me, some of the best um, connections um, that I have made and the people that I continue to stay in touch with have been where we've been trying to wrestle with some of the same issues and together worked through things that probably we could not have made as much progress on on our own. So I, I often think coming together and finding people who are trying to deal the same things. Because what are we going to spend our time on when we go home? It's those things that are in front of our face. And what I love about, um, I think, our community across the state, as well as the ability to connect with Newton, is that we've just broadened our network of people who we can connect with. And so I often try to think about what am I trying to deal with and where are there people out in the network that I can um, pull in to help. And I think the commons can facilitate some of that as well because it represents an archival source of conversation and discussion that can continue to be added to. So I'll just kind of combine those two things together. Okay, thank you. State University of New York at Old Westbury was originally modeled after Evergreen College, for those who are not familiar with Evergreen, Hampshire College, which started in 1985, about 20 years after that, um, uh, uh, is a college that um, um, stresses uh, internships, mentorships, uh, uh, and, and, and a less formal curriculum. Uh, to some extent, uh, all freshmen at SUNY Old Westbury, entering freshmen, go through a one-year uh, program. There is uh, interest in um, returning and uh, I think interest in, in returning back to a model that has uh, you know extended internships uh, mm. as much as possible. Uh, if you have a speakers bureau, uh, there could be enormous advantage in your your organization uh, uh, coming and being a part of presentations that we make uh, to various outside parties that identify um, the benefits of the uh, uh, tools that are out there. Um, that, that, of course, has obvious benefits for campuses of, of, that have that kind of thing because it, 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 it promotes uh, right. uh, SUNY engagement and presumably would have benefits for your organization because outside <laughs> funding might come you know, from organizations that say, wow, this is important. Right. Well, that, that's an interesting idea to to um, to explore how even a, a directory could be utilized to identify those areas of expertise and a willingness to participate in 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 groups like that. Yeah, if your organization can generate a, a directory and some sort of uh, calendaring device, so that effectively a virtual right. speakers bureau that gets people who are geographically uh, feasible and good speakers. Uh, that's that's very interesting. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, come on over here. This is maybe a little bit more of a nuts and bolts sort of thing, but um, my experience when I became uh, a, a coat fellow, there was a gap between basically until Alex told me that even though I was a coat fellow, I wasn't on the coat community. And I, with the proliferation of this stuff within SUNY and within you know all these different organizations where the stronger partnerships are, where there's different sort of programs and websites and communities, if we could get, I mean, or at least where SUNY is involved, if we could work towards like a universal login because it is the amount of passwords and usernames and stuff that I have to keep track of these days is like a two front and back 
page sheet and the fact that I've got my coat community hub login, which is different than my open SUNY common stuff, which is different than my the three or four different things I have for my campus. Like if we could look at consolidating some stuff across the system, you I know, think that would go a know, long way. <laughs> I, I think that's that consolidation kind of for, for SUNY's conversation is an interesting idea. I'd, I'd like to propose that there's also the reality is that you're never going to get a, a, a one easy format across the board. And, and I've, I've tried to think a lot about how, how do you leverage your networks, your personal networks. I, I think of telephone trees, you know, the, the, how, do you, how do you put out the call and say, hey, I'm looking for something and have those peers that you're in touch with or involved with three or four different groups. Uh, I, I, that's, that's partly a professional development kind of strategy, like knowing who to ask for particular kinds of questions. But I think, I do think there are some roles that, that our organizations can play in helping to facilitate those kinds of, of conversations as well. I just, it, it's tempting to think that it's, that we should build the system that, that will do that perfectly. I think we need to make improvements to the system wherever mm -hmm. possible, but really at, recognize that it's those human connections that are really going to be uh, valuable. Hey, Dale, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. Uh, I, those of you who haven't met Robert Rosenbaum, Managing Director of Newton, and the poor fellow next to me just got elected board chair yesterday, Justin. So um, you, you may not want to clap for him just yet. He doesn't know what he took on. But anyway, just I appreciate the feedback. Meeting with our IT folks next week, so let me see if there's a way that at least with uh, the commons that you guys are using, if we can't pass a token on that and move the single sign in across. I'll, I'll get in touch with Alex and that sort of thing. You do have some kind of static content parked at suny.nutn.org. Uh, and so whatever we're able to work out for right now, we'll link from there. And then I'm sure Alex and Kim will push it out to you through the normal uh, resources. We're also connected in for sure to the SUNY CPD listserv. So, uh, our stuff will be showing up there, and you can get back to us through that route as well. So sorry to interrupt, but. So, so I think there are, um, there, there's a comment back here. I was going to suggest that open is, is your mic on? Mike, press the red button. Um, an open calendar could be maintained. That you mentioned that you have presentations or other meetings throughout the year. Um, if we put those on an open calendar and indicate it open, which means I could go to Broome and attend it, or closed, okay, I can't go there, but I know Broome is pulling together a bunch of people that are interested right. in this subject, and I'm interested in it, so I contact the, the person doing it. If that were, if we were just allowed to post our meetings and presentations on that, um, then we'd be able to see who's doing what throughout the year. I think it's a very good idea. Yeah. Uh, they can do a calendar so I can talk Just ask people to talk about some of the things they're dealing with. So we would love to hear, uh, similar to your point around challenges, we'd love to hear some of the things you're grappling with and maybe we can <coughs> even do some breakouts um, to be able to talk through um, what other individuals are doing around those topics. So are there certain topics, areas, things that you're grappling with on your campuses um, that would, you know, bubble up to an, an area for us to be able to kind of pull together a little mini group together on? Yes. So I, I work at Binghamton and it is very research focused. Or, and it's great to be around people here that are at community colleges or at more comprehensive institutions, but sometimes it's difficult to relate to that because my faculty research and publication is the primary their primary goal so very few and, and it's only that what the 40 the white men that are already in there that have been there for 20 years that can do, that can do anything exciting because they're so f f afraid of not getting tenure or not being able to publish so I'd really like to be with other people that have probably not figured it out, but at least can give me some ideas on how to really promote teaching at a research institution. I think that's a great um, option. I'm actually going to put Pete on the spot a little bit here in terms of editing the journal. I mean, there are opportunities for you to be able to have scholarly work that are around teaching and learning with a, with a great focus and emphasis. And so 
um, pushing that out to faculty or trying to help them think about the, the paradigm shift of how they get tenure uh, related to the work that they're doing around action research. You know, there, there are lots of opportunities for that, so that's a great, great suggestion. Does everybody know about the journal? The what? You want to say something about it? Um, you want to do the mic? Peter, use the mic. <laughs> so there's a journal, <laughs> formerly known as the Journal of Asynchronous Learning Networks, was uh, renamed the Online Learning Journal, and it was um, we recently merged with uh, the Journal of Online Learning and Teaching. Um, it's a, a major forum for the publication of scholarly research. It's blind peer reviewed. Um, we're probably getting something like 40 to 50 submissions a month right now. We have 4,000 reviewers in the open journal system. Um, we just brought on three new associate editors, um, Shauna Smith Chaggers from the Columbia University uh, Community College Research Center, um, Charles Graham from Brigham Young University, and uh, Trying to think of the third. Jennifer Richardson from Purdue. Um, but it's a major initiative of the Online Learning Consortium to position the journal as the premier uh, academic journal for uh, scholarship in online teaching and learning. So if folks are interested in a venue for publication, go to OLC and go to read, and you'll see all about it. Um, sounds like a great topic for a coach chat that we could share with our faculty on how they can produce articles to be submitted to that journal. That, that's a actually terrific lead into a, uh, a workshop that we're currently organizing with the uh, some of the associate editors and with um, Tony Picciano, Chuck Jubin, Patsy Moskal, um, and it's our uh, intention to enhance the author's services dimension of the journal um, to provide opportunities for understanding um, how, to pro how to develop specifically uh, the kinds of um, materials, the kinds of uh, publication standards, APA style, you know, all of, of what you'd need in order to have a, uh, uh, an empirical re research article. But also, we're going to be doing um, new um, workshops on the concept of digital scholarship and promoting yourself as a digital scholar, getting um, your name out there and sort of documenting your place in the world of, of scholarship. So there's going to be a, couple, a series of uh, workshops on, you know, how to benefit yourself and how to benefit the journal in terms of promoting your place in, the, in that universe and also specifically um, how to do things like um, experimental research design, qualitative research design to try to help um, younger scholars, maybe both doctoral students and folks who may be working at an assistant professor level or new to, um, to better understand how to get published. Where will this be advertised? And where will this be advertised, the series? It's uh, <coughs> the new director of <coughs> research and publications for OLC, Jill Bubin, is uh, working out a you know, timeline, and they're going to be um, promoting that relatively soon is my understanding. So should be hearing about it within the next couple of weeks. How, how will we know about it? How will my faculty know about it? How will you, don't, isn't everybody in the world getting bombarded by OLC emails? <laughs> if you don't get a couple of days, something's wrong. But um, I, I think that that may be an opportunity to filter out some of that, you know, over maybe highlight and focus some of the effort and maybe the opportunity is to do a um, an open SUNY, a coat chat or something to focus attention on it. Or you can just send me a note and say, hey, what's going on with this? Uh, I'll respond. So 
so other possible topics we could we could actually even huddle together with folks who are interested in digging into that concept more and if there's if there's more to say but are there other kind of topics that you're struggling with or or interested in I, I just want to revisit your point because I think it might have been missed a little bit is that if if I'm correct you're talking more about you're in a situation like us at ESF where we're a doctoral granting institution and so we are not going to be grappling with the same student population that a lot of the community colleges are dealing with and that our online initiatives are going to be probably more at I mean a lot of our stuff is our intent is it to be at a much it's going to be at the you know the 400 level or even the graduate level and so how we're dealing with very different faculty whose a good third of their time is is spent in research and publication not educational research research in their their subject area and so i think the the, the point was more about how do we maybe create a smaller network or group for those of us who are at who, who are dealing with a, a set of faculty who have a different priorities. different priorities yeah so they you know they have a teach they have a requirement for teaching but um, it's a requirement only. It's, like it's, not, it's not a passion. It never will be because they're getting multi million dollar grants to do, you know, yeah. research. Teaching is not their priority, but it's still their obligation. So, how do you, how do you help them? Yeah, how, how, how do we connect maybe at the, the, you know, the doctoral granting or at the, can we, can we look at things that are not? Uh, your intro level courses, but that are that are like advanced topics courses, and how do you deal with faculty who are who are working in those realms? Because I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of design stuff that doesn't matter what the course is that you know we all can learn from each other. But I think we're also dealing with some specialized topics that if we could connect together to compare notes and stuff, especially with how we're working with that particular type of faculty, I think would be helpful. I think that that's um, that that is a very interesting uh, community. I think, um, and I think there are ways to talk about both. How do you um, influence the campus conversation about um, prioritizing teaching? Um, but that's that's a hill, tough hill to climb. I think. I think that um, another very pragmatic conversation is about. Um, what kinds of programs do you have for developing TAs, GAs, that um, a development institute for for teaching that that really focuses in on those who will be doing some of the the heavy load that might not be the higher level uh, emphasis, but even if they're just assisting, there are things I think you can do to influence the quality of the instruction by having a formal certification program or or such with, with your uh, graduate student population? I think this is on. Um, I'd like to jump in with what I think is an extension of that, but I'm not sure. Um, so Northeastern's got this experiential reputation that traditional campus does co-ops. So I completely hear you on the research tenured faculty and their interest and skill <coughs> in instruction. Um, what a lot of the Northeastern traditional students get is, well, a, it's selective, so they're going to work really hard and read books and Google and kind of fix their own problems. But on the other side, if they get sent out to co-op, they've got this experiential, real-world educational thing. I was mentioning, I think, to Janet and I were talking a little about <clears throat> how that has almost been a serendipitous thing for a century. They just go out, do stuff, and come back, and they seem kind of more mature and worldly. <laughs> and it's not even necessarily been super wedded to the curriculum. So I get brought in to kind of do a snoo with the online version of that. And we were called the Rapid Curriculum Development Group. Then Rapid sounded not academic enough, so we changed again. We, changed again. we ended up with the online experiential learning team, which I kind of put together. And I don't know if you ever worked directly with oxymorons, but it's kind of oxy being the key part. Um, it, is, it is a challenge. And, and there are two sort of schools of thought of that. One was one. So, so the, the other part that's not me focused on the experiential and said, OK, online experiential learning, they have to go and do something and physically go out. And sort of mini co-ops were arranged. There's a, a sub-program where for six weeks they sort of collaborate. And it's doing you know, a mini version. 
in my world, I sort of switched that and, and focused on the online. And I think it's given my background that I've worked with a lot of online students who are online for a reason. They're either embedded military or they have disabilities or they have you know, three jobs and four kids. And there are real reasons why they don't want to go anywhere. So to say, hey, it's an online course that you can do fully online. And by the way, you have to go and work at the local shop. For se- just wasn't going to work. So we looked at the work of Kolb and others who've sort of tried to deconstruct what experiential is and build that back up. So there is a point to this. When you've got that research tenure, not so much interest in um, necessarily the skill and art of pedagogy, are there things you can do instructionally design-wise to build in activities or assignments? And my question, I guess, is I'm, I'm really interested in, we had some conversation in the break around what's starting to be called sort of big picture learning or authentic. I think it was sort of connected to Christie's work. Maybe just like throw some issue out there, you know, and, and embed that in a, in, a, in, a, in a discipline or in a class environment and say, you know, this, this sounds frivolous and I don't mean it to be, hey, explore curing cancer or solving world, world poverty. Um, Gardner Campbell, who is a great guy, some of you all know him, I saw him present recently. In Virginia, where he's based, they have this huge cycle event in the summer to the extent that they have to close down campus. He worked with 26 faculty to develop courses that were all focused in on the bike race. So there was the physiology, the psychology, the marketing, the policing, the security, etc. 26 online courses, each bearing <coughs> one credit. He got engagement and attention and excitement in a way that he hadn't really seen in online courses there before. So my question slash thought is maybe a solution to that is to think about this and, and what how can we get experiential and the benefit of that in possibly an online environment or possibly in an environment where there's less instructor engagement and can we think of ways to sort of build that out? So maybe that's a, a separate discussion that might not even be today, but I'm really interested in anything that people are doing with what's sometimes called big picture learning. It's definitely got elements of what Christie's doing and, and even elements of mine. Um, and those sort of specific cases where it's authentic, it's experiential, whatever that means, and you know the students, again, maybe they've got reduced fear of failure because they're actually involved in a bike race. They're not thinking, I'm terrible at psychology. Um, so maybe that's an extension of the discussion. Sorry. Jana, I, I think she had a hand up first. I actually have some material on virtual internships I'd be glad to share with you. Um, at SUNY, UFS, University Faculty Senate, we're putting out an internship co-op guide. And part of that is virtual internships. I supervise a lot of virtual internships. so. Be glad to share. Mm. Um, but the thing I wanted to ask, maybe off the subject, so you'll stop me the minute it becomes clear. But many of the people who speak here sound like whatever that book was, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. I'm doing, I'm doing open education, but no one else is. My campus doesn't understand me, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, the lunch table I sat at yesterday, we hatched a really good plot, I think, which was get faculty to take an online class and really take the online class. So they're doing the work, they're doing the tests, and they're getting a grade. Give them a course release to do that. The the minute that they are involved with online education, they will see its value. But then someone else added an even better idea to the notion. First of all, I think the notion is good. And as I say, you need to give them a course release. Faculty are crazed for time. But the other thing we ought to do is require upper level administration, all of them, to take a class and to go through it and to do the assignments and to take a test and to get a grade. Because our administration are, um, I think, philosophically supportive, but, and I'm not talking about my own campus, we're on tape here. (laughs) But I have heard in discussion about many higher level administrators who simply don't have a clue. And I also think that this would help enlarge the coach membership. Because when I keep talking about communication, how can I, where can I find this? How can I get information? I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about my whole campus. But if these people, faculty and administrators, took a course, any course they want, it's an online course, and went through the whole thing, I think coat membership would be of immediate and huge value to them. They'd want to get all the mailings. And we could automatically enroll them when they do that. Thanks. Just want to 
like I'm, I'm, I'm always the struggle. There's applied learning and there's experiential learning, and they sort of do this, and I, I never know. But I had a experiential applied learning. We, we started to teach a chemistry course online. And the person teaching the course made a brilliant statement. Hey, we, we, we send away for these kits, and they, they apply the learning by doing the experiment. But then she said something that I wasn't expecting. Yeah, but once the company puts together the kit, it's real easy to go online and find the answers, and then they just regurgitate what they read online and they didn't actually experience or apply the learning. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I thought I had a brainstorm. I, I, I took this out and I said, these all have video cameras, all your students, even though they say they can borrow one, make them videotape themselves doing the important part of each, it doesn't have to be the whole thing, but, and if they do that, you can document the applied learning, not going somewhere online and faking that you did it. And damned if it didn't work. <laughs> and it's like we thought, well, they'd struggle with the technology of posting. Yeah. You post the video on YouTube and you link to it. Yeah. And it really worked. So it, how, do you, how do you do applied online? You make them videotape essential parts to demonstrate that they didn't cheat. We, we talked to Berkeley College of Music and they had students, you know, playing the drums and stuff and taping them. I think, I think the key part of that is the, the idea of people talk about low threshold applications. I mean, you know, giving the people the opportunity to play with technology without being prescriptive and saying you have to learn this tool, I think is also motivating. And I think that's a key part to factor in with all these. If we're giving up control to an extent and the whole Copernican idea, you're at the middle, you know, you need to do it, you need to demonstrate the skills, maybe you have more input around how you do that, how you show it, how you demonstrate it. And I, that's, that's where I'm kind of questioning the Gardner Campbell, Gardner Campbell thing. No one necessarily is saying you have to study bike racing or make a career of it, but maybe sort of freeing up the context a little bit is, is something that we can look at and has potential in saying, you know, what I, and again, not to hark on about my stuff, but the guy who said make your own narrative, you kind of don't care how they learn microeconomics if they learn it. So I think there's something about that and there's something about giving up the control and having the, but again, maybe that's pedagogic skill and then it gets back to the lady at the back and the comment around people where that's not their first priority. Uh, you, it's, it's what works for you and your institution. It's tough to generalize, I think. One of the things just as, as a generalized comment that, you know, I think technology is an amplifier and you know, if you, you can buy the nicest Les Paul electric guitar and have huge 12-foot stack just like they had at Wembley Stadium, and if you get up and you can't play the guitar, it's going to amplify bad practice just as readily as it's going to amplify good practice. And I think almost everything we've been talking about today and yesterday throughout this entire thing, they're tools, and they can be applied poorly and they can be applied masterfully. And I, I think that's the part of the challenge here, the, the, the conceptual kind of what is it about that experience that helped that student get it. And um, that's, that's why this is sort of a lifelong discipline of continuing to try and figure out what amplification is appropriate and doesn't just become noise. As soon as you become so concerned with the care and feeding of the machine, I think a lot of times your assessment system becomes the machine that you're, you bow down to and, and serve, and you forget what the outcomes were supposed to be you know, when, when, when you started this whole thing. So, so I, I think there, there are many opportunities to hear examples of these innovative kind of, sometimes the disruptive influence is as much about realizing that separation as anything else, that you just see, oh yeah, that's what we're doing here. And it's just a different perspective on the same thing we've been doing. The, danger of it, of dismissing it because it's new, um, it is, is, is that you'll be left behind in that opportunity to identify the meat that, that's really in there. Uh, so I would just offer, you know, as you think about personalization and adaptive and some of the
quote unquote new catchy terms that are coming out there, it's sometimes it's just old wine in new bottles, right? So when we think about some of the things we've talked about today and, and conceptually where we're trying to push the learning science to help us figure out these, these ill-defined problems, right? I mean, just as you mentioned, that's really what we're after, not feeding a machine that has a black box that we can't see the analytics behind. Mm -hmm. Um, is to be able to, to optimize the learning environment for the students. I'm not sure what our time frame is. Well, um, we have a little more time if people want to keep talking. Yeah. So, so what? Just to, as one possible kind of evolution of, of what Christy's saying, that the um, we're we're working right now on trying to figure out adaptive learning and. There are many kind of pathways. There's, there's a big push right now for adaptive for advising and entire systems that are being put together to help advisors and students use adaptive learning tools and concepts to, to figure out where they should be going. At the same time, you have adaptive online programs, usually fully online, usually um, really pointed at competency-based kind of programs. Some of the more interesting space, um, that, not that that isn't fascinating, but there, there's a lot of activity right now around applying adaptive concepts in a residential context. Mm -hmm. And how do you have someone who has an adaptive system available to them that you not only manage the curriculum, you're walking through and looping back through remedial courses when you need to, but you're being connected with and a counselor, an advisor, or, or you know, you're being put into a group uh, session at the right time because you've developed those concepts, not because it's the third week in the course, but because you've got the three prerequisites for, for doing that kind of activity. The, the challenge with all of these, I think, for us is that you have to start with a huge amount of dependence on the mm -hmm. systems and the commercial entities that are providing these things. And there's some, there's some chicken and egg kind of uh, challenges to how far down that road do you go before you stop and realize that the metadata, the, the, the activity data that's being generated is, you know, that, that's the, the nerdiest thing you want to start having faculty's eyes glaze over faster than anything, start talking about learning activity data repositories but but that's that's the coin of the realm as you as we move forward into these new systems and everything that we used to think is important the vendors will now give you for free because now you are the product your activity is the product and this so so this really has a point i think for me understanding the nuances of that require all of us to, to play in this sandbox, to, to be familiar enough with the concepts that are going on that we don't find ourselves beholden to a black box because it felt too foreign and we just didn't ever really have time to jump in. So I, I would love to find opportunities to have conversations about what are the low threshold opportunities to start to nibble at the edges of these concepts of adaptive learning and the systems that are behind them because that's a big, big thing to try and tackle. And it's going to overwhelm some of the things that we're doing, I think. So anyone has that answer, you can meet me in the hallway after, <laughs> after, afterwards. But, but I do think topically that maybe there, there's, there's some room to start talking about those um, activity data harvesting processes. The, we've talked a lot about algorithms and learning analytics, you know, but that's usually like institutional research, mm -hmm. harvesting the results of course outcomes and trying to turn the big ship of the university's uh, agenda. This is at the other end of the spectrum, taking those micro points of activity data and helping the student to turn their ship or the instructor to understand how to turn the ship of the student or the course. It's at a much more granular level. Um, and I think we all have to become more versed in what's involved with those transactions. Um, because, you know, it sounds a little bit tinfoil hat-ish, that was an image earlier, but it's coming, and it's coming quickly, I think. Well, to the uh, 
those concept quizzes that you did before, because that when you get down to that micro level, mm -hmm. then that really comes, to, in my mind, to the instructor and the student. We right. can we keep looking to technology to you know run this thing and tell me what they're doing, and instead I'm thinking that's that's a level where you're as the instructor go to the student, you know, and and most of us know right by now. And I I love your presentation. That was great. Those little you know concept quizzes, because that's the quickest way to just rethink those questions and catch them right there where they where they missed it before you even get to the first assessment. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe looking into that type of a technology, if you can transfer it to that, and rethinking the way we're formulating questions and coming up maybe through a technology for these little concept quizzes. So, you know, low stakes doesn't really count for anything, but just rewording those to find out when we're losing the student or when they've got it. And these ones can jump ahead, and these ones we have to sort of catch. I think it's interesting as the field has changed. We, we didn't know what a learning scientist was 10 years ago, right? So as we think about this whole notion around how we engage our students in assessments, most of us are either have been faculty ourselves, know our course content, but how many people have psychometrics in their background? So how do we know what we're developing is actually saying, is measuring what we think it's measuring? I mean, there's a whole layer that we have not uncovered that I'm also concerned about. We're doing um, five different adaptive learning pilot projects with five different vendors or grantees. And so getting down to that, that, that meta level is really key for us. We can crunch numbers all day, but Sometimes it's that small incremental change in the assessments that you build that really have the, the greatest impact. And, and I'll just make a quick analogy as well that, that I try to help faculty understand. Like the, there's, a, there's a concept called a filter bubble, like with your um, online search engines. This was discussed a, a few years ago. But if, if we all got identical laptops or tablets and we opened them up and opened the same browser and we all typed SUNY code we would all get identical results, just about guaranteed. The very first time, if you assume that they're brand new, you cracked them open, you haven't done anything else on them, they're all identical. We all go away, we come back next year, we all type in SUNY code. Everyone's results are going to be different. And that's based upon an algorithm that the system is watching what you're clicking on and trying to promote things. In the case of a browser, it's things that they think you'll want to buy. Um, if it's Facebook, it's things that you'll click on, and ultimately that they're generating revenue. But there are assumptions that are being made that, um, oh, you clicked on this multiple times, and so that must be part of your demographic. It doesn't even usually assume that you're a critical thinker who wants to explore the opposite point of view. But in the process, you might be missing things that are being filtered out. So. So we've been talking a lot about the idea of what if you could peel back the corner and just take a look at what assumptions are you using to create this filter because an unfiltered search is not helpful. You can go out there and use search engines like DuckDuckGo and do an unfiltered search and it's so very difficult. It's, it's, it's almost useless. So you need the filters but I think that we become so reliant on the filters that it's, it, if you don't understand what's being done, then that's the black box. So the analogy for me is as these systems, these adaptive systems, begin to make decisions for students and for faculty in terms of recommending which curricular pathways, even kind of delivering content, I think we need to insist the ability to peel back the corner. And for the student to learn the implications, we're making this recommendation based upon your performance in this activity, your feedback on this. Let them see with transparency. And I tell you right now that in the current environment, that's intellectual property of these, these organizations that will never, ever let you peel back that corner. So, so this is a little of a political activist kind of message, but I think that we have to understand what's going on in those recommendation systems. And, and it's going to require people raising their hand and saying, look, I don't think we should go sign this contract until we have a better understanding of what they're doing with our activity data. And, and we can figure out the details as we go, but right now, it's these big system level purchases and, and contractual, you know, 
um, agreements that I think we, we want to get our toe in the door at least and consider what the implications of these systems are. And I can offer that all of the work that we have done hasn't gone well. Back to Dale's point around sticking your toe in the water. I mean, you have to be willing, you know, innovation is also about failure, learning from the failure and moving forward. And so having opportunities to work with different vendors um, has given us a really good in interest and inside look into how this actually works. I mean, sometimes you could do a prototype that you know requires five grand or ten grand to be able to really see what you're getting into until you go to before you go to enterprise level. Um, so you know I echo those sentiments as well. I just want to bring up a point, like working with the when faculty do things and they sign up with one of the major publishers and the publishers keep track of these students data and exactly what you're saying, they, they won't peel back the layers, but if you go read the user license agreements, and the one thing that they all have is that we reserve the right to share whatever your students, you and your students give over this system with our third party partners, which basically you're telling them they can do whatever the hell they want with your data and that if you decide to use their product, you're forcing the students in that class to also engage in their research because if the student doesn't agree to it either, then they can't participate. So it's it's more, it's, it's, it's not just the professor right. saying, oh, well, it's okay with me. The instructors don't care if it's okay with the students. Well, I want to use this and, and the student can drop my class. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's like... Well, and I, I would say that the biggest challenge we face right now is that it, the easiest way to look at this is to say, wow, those corporate entities, they're not in our, in our best interest. I'm going to fold my arms and we're going to stay right here because we're on the higher moral ground. The, that moral ground will just erode right underneath you as the as the this industry passes us by, and and I, this sounds all doom and gloom, way more doom and gloom. I've got a cold. Maybe it's the med cold medicine that's talking, but I, I I think there's tremendous opportunity. But I think like as Christy was saying, we need to dip our toes in these waters. This is not comfortable for if if you've cut your teeth in a different way of, of teaching and learning with technology, these systems feel foreign and it's hard to understand where to even start. But I think, to loop back to our topic, these collaborative conversations, sometimes talking to someone and realizing that, oh, they gave a presentation at, at that conference, but when I talked to them in the hallway afterward, I realized they're only half a step ahead of where I am. You know, that it's easy to feel an us and them kind of uh, distance when you actually talk to people, you realize that we're all struggling with the same things. So um, using the opportunity of this network to ask questions. Look, I heard him say these terms. Does anyone even know what they're talking about? Can we, you know, can we have a conversation, a phone call, a conference? Uh, be proactive about stitching together your own community of practice um, based upon the concerns and professional uh, background that you have. All right, a, a closing comment here. Oh, actually, I was going to say, in, in terms of areas that I'd like to see collaboration on, going back to Kevin's point about the, the co-ops, I think that's another area that I would like to see a community of practice develop around because for us, we're working on that, something sort of similar to that, and how does online support uh, practicum? So again, different population of students, and, and I think that's also an inroad for, some, to, for, for getting some faculty buy-in because we have programs like landscape architecture where students are going out and doing placements for a semester. And so I think as an inroad as to how, can, how, does, how does online support, how can faculty be in a place and support those students, and we're, we're doing another one with, uh, we're piloting right now with students who are going to be doing uh, practicum of community planning where they're going to be actually being placed out. And so it's been an on-campus class, but then how does, how does, what are the best practices for when students are actually going to be somewhere else and be supported in an online format for a good chunk of it? 
and, and, and how does the faculty interface in that? I think there would be a great community of practice around that. Yeah. And I think, I think that's the way we are going to get through this. It, it's stories, it's anecdotes, it's what you tried that worked, it's what you tried that didn't. You know, that guy from Waterloo who did little games for his students on co-op. Let's play with that. But I think, you know, we all have to learn from each other's mistakes, successes. And until you put sort of a face and a project on it, it's a theoretical technological implementation that if you flick this button, it might work. But it's not going to happen. Connecting people, that's what works. Sure, well, I, I just tried to take some notes up here. We can take a picture of it and, and post it. Um, but I think there's a, there are a couple of ideas, um, conversations around uh, virtual internships, co-ops, uh, collab, practicum. Uh, there's some information about the online learning journal that we want to make sure everyone's aware of and maybe look for ways for COAT to be a, a vehicle for, for promoting that. Shared calendars between the organizations, uh, shared login um, information across sites. We'll try to improve that. And then just some other takeaway ideas. But um, it's been a very nice conversation and a very nice several days so we, we appreciate you having us with you uh, mel did you have a, a comment you want to make yeah if i could just say at the end uh you know coat the level of the quality of the uh, last few days has been just wonderful and uh, i think the interesting thing about technology is that uh in, in education that we're all engaged in is that we actually meet face to face in some nice places uh, and I like the, someone used the concept of hatching over lunch uh, and talking in hallways. Uh, the nice thing about Newton is that for me and for many others, it's been um, sort of a personal and professional journey over a long period of, uh, of time. And it represents a diversity that sometimes we don't, don't have diversity of experiences. Of, Newton's composed of four-year, two-year, uh, public, private, uh, small and large uh, institutions and some associations uh, that has been incredibly enriching and I think these kinds of conversations are incredibly enriching so I hope we have a chance to cross paths personally as well as on the technology because it's those hallway conversations that hatching over lunch uh, that creates those uh, uh, partnerships and alliances and collaboration and the ability to call somebody and say, hey, can I put your name on a grant? Uh, can you, can I use you as an advisor? Can I add credibility by spreading my wings and showing that we represent more than just us? So uh, thank you for that opportunity and I hope we have some in the future. <laughs> thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin and Dale and Christy and all of the Newton board members who were here with us today. Thank you all. Um, I um, want to uh, put a plug in for the summit next year. Uh, we will be in balmy Syracuse again in February. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, you all there. Thank you to everyone for everything. Thanks to the virtual people and to everyone who helped make this event um, successful. Have a safe journey home and I'll see you next year in Syracuse. Thank you. Thank you.